This is going to be verse by verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And the Apostle Paul is one of the greatest Christians and the, one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. And in this study on 1 Corinthians chapter 2, let's look at the subject of what kind of preacher was the Apostle Paul. Number one, Paul was a preacher who used plainness of speech. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1, it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So Paul was an educated man who could have given you excellency of speech and wisdom of words. In Acts 22, 3, it says, Paul says, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye are, as ye all are this day. So he sit at the feet of this man named Gamaliel, a man with great smarts, and he still didn't use excellency of speech. He still didn't try to convince people of how smart he was. When he preached, he didn't show his education. And here is what Paul says that his enemies said about him. In 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, it says, For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So he was contemptible. contemptible. He didn't care to let it rip, as they say. And in 1 Timothy 2, 7, it says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. In 2 Corinthians eleven six, he says, But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been truly made manifest among you in all things. So Paul was knowledgeable, but talked rough and plain, as the common everyday man you see on the street, and even warns against men who use excellency of speech and wisdom of the world while they preach. In Romans sixteen eighteen, it says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So good words and fair speeches are something used to deceive the masses. They, this is what the people want, though. They don't want plainness of speech like Paul gives. In 2 Timothy 4, 3, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. But Paul didn't do this. He used plainness of speech. 2 Corinthians three twelve, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. So, Paul was a plain preaching preacher. And number two, Paul's preaching was the preaching of the cross. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, it says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So, Paul didn't try to impress people with what he knew. He just wanted to make sure of who they knew and what they were doing about it. Paul not only wanted to know if they were sure of the gospel, the fact that Jesus is their crucified, buried, and risen Savior, but he also wanted to know if they were living a crucified life after they have been saved. Have they crucified the flesh? Are they reckoning their flesh to be dead and walking in newness of life? Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So he not only wanted to know if they were saved, but wanted to know if they were acting like they were saved. Were they walking in newness of life? Paul's greatest fear was people not receiving his message 
or after that they received it, turning back to the world. And this is why he says in verse 3, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. So they said about Paul that his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. But this is the only way he's weak. Paul's fear didn't have to do with being ashamed of the gospel, as he says in Romans 1.16, that he isn't ashamed. However, he is afraid they won't receive the message he has for them and that his labor will be in vain. In Galatians 4.11, he says, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So he's afraid that his labor towards them is going to be in vain. However, Paul really knows that when it comes right down to it, that our labor in the Lord is never really in vain. In 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So Paul will get a reward for preaching the gospel. Uh, seeds were planted when he preached the gospel. And he said in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So every time you plant, every time you water with the gospel, it's never in vain. Isaiah fifty five eleven says, So shall my word be that, he, be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. So the word won't return void. And the preaching of the cross is the greatest thing every Christian can do and should do. And Paul, our example, was a preacher of the cross. So he used plainness of speech while he preached the cross. And he did this with number three, the power of God. What kind of preacher was Paul? He was a preacher with the power of God. In verse 4 in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So Paul's words were biblical words, words the common man can understand, that is, where you find the power of God. When referring to Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Luke 4.32, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. So everything Jesus said was the word of God because he is God. We just got the parts God wanted us to have in our perfect and complete Bible, but his word is power. And that's why the right gospel is the power of God. And a true Bible teacher will speak to the common man, even if the Bible teacher is a very educated man. And this is why I like the common man's reference Bible. Uh, the David Hoffman, the man who produced it, doesn't try to seem like a scholar, but he defends the power of God, the words of God. 1 Corinthians 2, five says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So if Paul used the enticing words and spoke like a genius, then your faith would stand in the wisdom of men and not the power of God. In verse 6, it says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. So Paul speaks wisdom among them that are perfect. That is the Christian. A Christian has the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. This means that when you got saved, the Lord gave you Jesus Christ's sinless record. So in a sense, you are perfect. But in a sense, you aren't perfect. Every Christian has two natures. You have your flesh that still sins, but you have your inner man that doesn't sin. But Paul preached the cross with the power of God. That is the main thing. Yet it isn't the only thing. Paul talks about giving the whole counsel of God. When he preached, you know, he gave everything God had given him. And there is more in the Bible than just salvation. So Paul talks about many other things. And that's why, number four, what kind of preacher was Paul? He was one that was faithful to present the mysteries. And a lot of preachers don't do that. But in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, it says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. 
So it says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. So God revealed to Paul some mysteries that he hadn't revealed to anybody else, and he was a faithful steward to preach the mysteries. And I believe this particular mystery here in verse 7 has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, burial, burial and resurrection. But there are other mysteries, things that the wise men of this world know nothing about. And if you sit under someone like Paul, then you'll see he's faithful to teach you the mysteries. A teacher should not just teach someone what they know, but teach them how to find out more on their own so that his students will end up knowing more than he knows. In Psalms 119, 99 through 100, it says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. As born-again believers, we have access to information that the smartest men in the world don't have. The scientists, professors, politicians, NASA, and all the people with a lot of brains lack infinite amount of wisdom because they refuse to believe the Bible. Even the big-name pastors and teachers with huge ministries who get all the credibility as Bible teachers and scholars and great men of God lack wisdom because they change the words of the book of all books. They change the Bible. They're not really Bible believers. The real Bible teachers of this world are few and far between and have little to no recognition whatsoever. Among Baptists, the men who are praised the most are the ones who can move the crowd who can get people excited, that can put on a big show. But you don't hear much about teachers like Bevins Welder, David Hoffman, Kyle Stevens, James Knox, Bob Alexander, and other great Bible teachers. Outside of Bible-believing Baptists, you, just, you don't hear much about someone like Peter Ruckman. These are men who can get people interested in the Bible not just a temporary excitement that will last until Monday morning. You can scare Christians. You can make them feel guilty. You can give them temporary excitement through being a good orator. But unless you give them a genuine, sincere interest in the Bible, then the effects you have on them are just temporary effects. The wisdom of this world and the words of men only have temporary effect. You need the words of God. You need to... Get, give someone a genuine interest in the Bible. And the only way to do that is to show them something in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. So they crucified him through ignorance. And in Acts three fourteen through 17, it says, But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. So if they had known he was God, they wouldn't have crucified him, but they did. They rejected the Messiah and are now blind in part, which is also a mystery according to Romans eleven twenty five, the mystery of the blindness of Israel. So Paul was faithful to present these mysteries. He was a preacher that used plainness of speech when he preached the cross with the power of God and he presented the mysteries. And then next, he puts an emphasis on heavenly things. A great preacher will keep your mind on heavenly things. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10, it says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So we can have an idea of what eternity will be like for us because the Spirit reveals them to us. In the Old Testament, before the written word of God, the Lord used dreams and visions to reveal things to men. Now he uses 
the Word of God, the King James Bible. When a born-again child of God reads the Word with a sincere heart, then the Spirit of God reveals things to him. And we see over in Revelation the description of the heavenly Jerusalem. You can know the deep and secret things of God. We know a little bit about heaven. We know a little bit about some things that are going to be in heaven. A good pastor or teacher will put the emphasis on eternal things and not on temporary things. When you put the emphasis on the temporary things, you lose the power. The temporal things are money. When a person spends all their time talking about tithing, you know, it sounds fake and has no power. When a person spends all their time talking about how to make their church building bigger and better, it has no power because that emphasis is on an earthly building. If they put an emphasis on soul winning for the purpose of making the building get bigger, making it more packed out, instead of putting an emphasis on soul winning to get heaven more full, then they're trying to make their own little kingdom. And then they are doing it for their own motive. But you see all the prosperity preachers, their emphasis is on temporal things. Their emphasis is on getting something while they're here, not when they get over there in heaven. But the spirit of an, of an animal can't know the things of man. In 1 Corinthians 2.11 it says, For what knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So here you see the spirit of an animal can't know the things of a man. And man can't know the things of God unless the Spirit of God is in him. And 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man can't know the things of God. He can't know about heavenly things because he, the Spirit of God is not in him. Just like an animal doesn't understand us. But the natural man says, why would a loving God send anyone to hell? The natural man says, if God knew Adam and Eve would eat the fruit, then why did he make Adam and Eve? And when a Christian asks these questions, they are speaking from their fleshy side. But the natural man doesn't know the things of the Spirit of God because these things are spiritually discerned. And they don't have the Spirit of God to be able to discern. The natural man, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's the natural man. But the spiritual man, the one that's saved, the one that has the Spirit of God in him, he knows there's a heaven, he knows there's a God, and he has his affection set on things above, not on things on the earth. So Paul puts an emphasis on heavenly things, and next he proves that salvation is free. And in 1 Corinthians 2.12, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. The natural man doesn't know that the things of God are freely given. The natural man wants to earn it. He wants to make it to heaven by his works. He can't comprehend that God would freely give him access to heaven. Paul is heavy on teaching salvation by grace through faith without works as a free gift. It says in verse 13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So in studying the Bible, you must compare things. It's good to have a teacher, but the final authority should always be the Bible. When expounding on verses, you should compare the verses with other verses. As it tells us in Isaiah 28, 9 and 10, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So the Bible interprets itself. And many say, well, everyone has their own interpretation. Sure they do, but that doesn't work when we are looking for the final absolute authority. Everyone has their own opinion, but there's one true way to look at it. In Second Peter one twenty it says, Knowing this first, that the no prophecy of the scripture is of any 
private interpretation. In 1 Corinthians 2.15, it says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. And you know the popular verse people use all the time. Matthew 7 1 says, Judge not that you be not judged. But this is referring to a hypocritical judgment of another man. And if you're spiritual, you will judge. You will judge all things without doing some judging you're not going to be able to say if something's right or wrong someone may say you can't say um shacking up is a sin for example because you shacked up in your past or you can't say drinking is wrong because you drank in your past but that's foolish talk of the natural man paul the apostle himself delivered men into satan because they blasphemed even though before he was right with the Lord, he compelled Christians to blaspheme himself. In Acts 26, 11, it says, And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. That was Paul in the past before he was right with the Lord. Then in 1 Timothy 1, 20, it says, Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So at one point he was compelling men to blaspheme, then he's delivering men unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh because they blasphemed. He's not a hypocrite. He's using righteous judgment, not hypocritical judgment. It's okay to judge even if you've committed the, the offense yourself. And if you can't say something was wrong, because you did it in the past, then no one could ever speak against any sin ever because we've all done wicked things in the past. If you've told a lie before, can you not say, well, it's wrong to tell a lie? In 1 Corinthians 2.16, it says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So if you're saved... You have the mind of Christ in Romans eleven thirty three through 34. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath, hath been his counselor? You can't figure God out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? You can't give God advice. You can't tell God something that he didn't already know. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? but we have the mind of Christ. After you're saved, you think a certain way about sin that you never thought about it before, and that's the mind of Christ. Some Christians don't see sin as bad as other Christians see it. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So after you get saved, you need to begin transforming your mind. Get rid of the junk that you was doing before and replace it with the Bible. Replace it with preaching. Replace it with prayer. And this is how your mind will begin to transform. Your mind will be, be start begin to be molded to be like Christ's. To where you see sin is sinful. You'll like the things of God. You'll have your affection set on things above. But this is the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we've looked at the subject about... What kind of preacher is Paul? And he's one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. And one of the greatest things you can do is be sure to read the Bible and also read the Pauline epistles, Romans through Philemon and Hebrews. You know, look at what Paul did. How did he act? What did he do that made him one of the greatest preachers ever, one of the greatest Christians ever?